turn there. <clears throat> Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. You may be seated. You can be seated. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of being here. Thank you for speaking to us through music. Thank you for speaking to us through your word, how powerful it is. Thank you that on Sunday we studied about a man as a young person wrote a powerful hymn that was scripturally accurate, but it wasn't true in his life. He had never even been saved. And 20 years later, 30 years later, he's sitting as an older man having lived life and brokenhearted, and he walks into this church and hears the choir singing the hymn that he wrote as a young person, and it convicted him and it changed his life. Lord, help us to know that it's not the fact that we sing, it's not the things that we do, it's your grace, it's knowing Jesus Christ, seeing him, loving him, being committed to him. And thank you that when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have life, eternal life. And that's when everything begins, when there's something that's real inside of us. A woman who's brokenhearted, that uh, really uh, had no answer for life, had been married multiple times, was living with a man outside of marriage, and yet met Jesus Christ. And he offered living water because that's who Jesus is. He's life. He's light. He's living. And when he's in us, we're alive. But when he's not in us, we're not alive. And help us to know that and understand that and believe that truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> Christmas, we looked at the message. Actually, that was in our Spanish service. But uh, on Thursday night, uh, we looked at the candlelight service. We looked at... Uh, the gospel, or we look from Christmas from from above, from the perspective of John's gospel. John's gospel is so different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have been called the synoptic uh, gospels, optic, the way that you view something, and soon is to see it all together. And so they look at Jesus from a similar perspective. But John looks at Jesus from above, and in John 3, 31, it states that uh, uh, about being from above, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. So there in that passage, two times it says, he, he who comes from above is above all. He who comes from heaven. So from above, from heaven, is above all. And it's a powerful truth about who Jesus Christ is. So the Synoptic Gospels teach that he's a human being, uh, but John is really giving us to understand that this is the divine Son of God and that we have to believe in him. The, the other gospels speak of that as well. Uh, Jesus talking about himself, calling himself the son of man. Uh, a lot of people believe that because Daniel, and Daniel it says, and it calls the Messiah being the son of man. And so he was claiming uh, to be the Messiah. And Jesus made some pretty audacious claims that if, if it's not true, if he's not who he said he is, of course, he's a liar or he's a lunatic. But that's not the case. He's the Lord. But he has to be your Lord. Have you met him? Do you have life? If you have life, it's abundant life. If you have life, it's eternal life. That's the only type of life that Jesus has. It's real. And in John chapter 14, the sixth I am passage, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So you can't work your way to heaven. You can't be good enough. You can't do a whole lot of good things. Uh, you can't say enough uh, rosaries or other things. There's nothing that you can do 
nothing that a Baptist can do. There's nothing that any denomination can do to make ourselves right with God. It is through Jesus Christ. This is where the life comes from him, knowing him. So he makes incredible claims for Jesus and uh, he calls him God. And then in uh, uh, verse 14, and the word, this is the word was God, the word is God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So there's the humanity. So he dwelt among us. He lived among us. That word dwelt is he tabernacled among us. So Jesus calls himself, I'm the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was the picture of the presence of God. You remember the fire by night and the cloud by day. And it was synonymous with the presence of God. So in our readings, I don't know if you guys have gotten the new readings that we're doing, but we're reading through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we're doing that in the whole year. But this winter quarter, we're focusing in on, uh, at the beginning, Matthew. And so we read the first three chapters of Matthew. And then we've also read through Genesis uh, uh, chapter 9. So Genesis is pretty, pretty powerful, too. And it talks uh, about a lot of things. And uh, there's a lot of things that we learned uh, in just reading those scriptures. And uh, it's amazing, you know, you'd think that uh, a pastor, I could read three chapters and, you know, it probably shouldn't take me more than five or ten minutes to read that. But I find that I'm taking an hour and a half or two to read those three chapters. It's just so rich. And so much is there. Uh, someone has said that if you know Genesis uh, 1 through 11, through the end of 11, not even 12 where you have Abraham, if you just know Genesis 1 through 11, you, need, you have everything that you need to know to understand life and what's going on in the world. It's pretty powerful. So in the Old Testament, we have the tabernacle and then we have the temple. And in John chapter 1, we have Jesus saying that, or they're writing about Jesus, and he tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent among us. He lived among us. He dwelled among us so that we might truly have life. John the Baptist saw Jesus. This is 1 verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank God for that. So he looks, John the Baptist sees him, and he sees him as the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God who deals with our sin problem. And he said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. And he says, I saw the Spirit, verse 32, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. You know, in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon them and then the Spirit would leave and then the Spirit would come upon them and the Spirit would leave. And the prayer oftentimes was, don't take your Holy Spirit from me or restore to me. Uh, give it back to me. Restore to me what I've lost. But here is the picture of Jesus and it remains on him. The, the Spirit descended upon him and remained on him. And... Uh, he says, I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's why when you get saved, things happen in your life. And it's pretty powerful. So chapter 1, he's tabernacling among us. But in chapter 2, he literally uh, calls himself the temple. The temple. So he's moved from the tabernacle to the temple. And he's revealing himself. Who is he? And so let's look at this just briefly or quickly. John 2 at verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So he's accepted the fact that he's the Lamb of God. The Passover is the killing of the Lamb and it's the picture of, of the sacrificial Lamb that takes away the sins of the people of Israel for another year. And so he says, yes, I will be that Passover lamb. So now he's going up and they're, they're celebrating it. And, and he has 
at least three Passovers that he experiences uh, as the Savior with his disciples, and he celebrates the, the, the Passover. So you can imagine how that he would feel knowing that he's going to die. I mean, how would you feel if you knew, hey, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be strung up on that cross, and you take that animal and you kill it? I mean, you know, I grew up on a farm, and and uh, we didn't take our cattle off till way past, not in the early times. We just killed our animals and ate them, you know. And so you kill the animal that you've raised. And so Jesus then is going to die for us. Why? So that we might have life. But so he's the temple, and he's clean, and he's never committed any sin. But that's not true about them. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple. So Jesus is pretty clever. He knew how to make a bull whip. He drove them out, man. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons. Now, notice he's he's turning, uh, he, he's driving them out, and uh, uh, the he the sheep and the oxen because he knew that they could get them back, but that they needed to think about what they're doing when they're going and getting them. That they they might think about what they've done that they've polluted the house of God. So if we come up here, if I come up here, and I uh, purposing in my heart to sin against God, I'm polluting the house of God. If you guys come up and you sing and you're not doing it for God's glory, you pollute the house. If we come and sit in our seats and we are not coming with purpose to know Jesus Christ and we're not filled with, a, we pollute the house of God. We dirty it up. We need to understand that. You know, there's consequences of sin in our life. We're so selfish and we're so with a veil over our eyes that we don't understand the need of holiness and to, to be clean. And Jesus came in a temple that was filthy and he tries to clean it up and he drives them out. But you notice that he, he, he told the ones that uh, had the birds, you know, he knew that if he let them, that they would not be able to get those things back. And so he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days but he was speaking about the temple of his body. So where does Paul get his teaching about our body being a temple of the Holy Spirit? He sat personally at the feet of Jesus. After he was saved, Jesus took him aside to the desert of Arabia, took him to a good seminary at the feet of Jesus. He taught him these things. But Jesus knew, says, that, that I'm the temple. I, this is my body is the temple of God. I am God come in the flesh. He knew who he was. And so he knew the temple. He knew, he, he lived in heaven. He saw the temple. There's a pattern. The Bible says there's a temple in heaven that the earthly temple is patterned after all of that. Some people say, well, well why should we be reading the Bible? Because these things that I know didn't come about because I just read it one time and I got it. No, it comes because I've read it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. It's read, it's, it's, I can say these things and speak these things because I meditate on it in my heart. And I dwell upon these things and think about what it means. And it's through the Holy Spirit. And it's not intellectually just trying to get it. It's sitting and trying to understand spiritual truth and understand what Jesus is saying and what he's teaching. And so the temple of his body, when he was therefore raised from the dead, say he's going back to where the, the temple worship is pure 
and holy. And he's down here on this earth and it's not so pure and it's not so holy. And so he wants to clean us up. His disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. How many times did they hear Jesus and not really believe? How many times do we hear Jesus and not really believe? How many times does he speak to us, but he says things that we don't want to hear? And so we reject it. That's why it says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. If you have eyes to see, make sure that you see. There's things that you need to see. And that's why we've been put, that's why we have so long. That's why most of us live so long. It takes a whole long, you know, some of these believers died at 27 years of age, maybe even younger. Incredible. But these, these were believers that were willing to give their life and to die for Christ at an early age, like David Brainerd, 29 years of age. Uh, another preacher, I can't think of his name right now, McShane. McShane, uh, he died at 29 years of age. He had taken a trip to the Holy Land. Uh, he was a guy that, that saw so much. Uh, it's incredible what somebody can know so quickly. And we sit around like, duh, what? You know, why? Because we don't, we've been given so many things so that we can know the word of God, but we would rather play and do things instead of really getting into God's word and letting our life be changed. So notice what he says. So in chapter one, he says, I'm tabernacling among you. I'm living among you. I'm pitching my tent so that you can see what, I'm like what God is like, what the Father's like. I'm trying to teach you these things. And I, I want you to know these things. And then in chapter 2, he says that, that my body is the temple. Uh, I'm speaking about the temple of, of, he was speaking about the temple of his body. And he was raised from the dead. So verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. So you see, John's kind of setting us up. And he's setting the stage. And you can see how the Spirit of God is moving. And you can see how that the Spirit is carrying along these different themes. And so what is he saying? So you, they believed when they saw the signs that he was doing. So note, listen to this. So that's verse 23. Look, look at what it says in 1 and 2 of chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he says they saw the signs that he was doing. And so here's a Pharisee that sees the signs and, and he says, we know that God's with you. But does he know that he's Emmanuel? Does he know that he's God? The word, is, that he is the way, the truth, the life. Does he know that? Well, go back to where it says, verse 24, but Jesus, many believed in his name, but Jesus did not believe in them. That's literally what it says. He did not entrust himself to them. Jesus didn't believe in them. They believed in him, but he didn't believe in them. Does he believe in you? Is he willing to entrust to you the sacred things? Because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. He knows what's in my heart. He knows what's in your heart. He knows. He knows. He knows whether we're putting on up here or down there. He knows if we're just putting on a show. If we're, He, he knows all about us. And, and that's a good thing. Because you don't have to make believe. You don't have to pretend. You can be honest. You can admit. You can be transparent. What happened in Genesis 1, 2, and 3? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, when they sin, in Genesis chapter 2, they're having fellowship with God and they walk with God and they enjoy His presence and all of a sudden, they commit sin. 
the devil comes and tricks, deceives Eve, and Adam literally sins intentionally and does what his wife says instead of what God says. And how many times have you gotten in trouble because of that? You do what your woman wants instead of what God wants. Boy, that'll get you in trouble. Mike Johnson used to say that uh, women have more pulling power than a D9, I think he said. That's a big old caterpillar. <laughs> and he says, you watch. He told me, he said, watch that little, that gal right there is going to pull him right out of the home. <laughs> He's going to pull him out of the ministry. And yep, there he went. <laughs> And boy, that's Adam and Eve right at the beginning, man. We, we just do dumb things. And then we also mess up, uh, and somebody was preaching about it, and I thought it was pretty good that we mess up because we don't uh, listen to our wives. You know, after we get saved, and we make financial decisions without listening to our wife. When we should, she's our other half, and we should listen, and so we make dumb purchases and stuff like that and lose money because, again, it's like, you know, you, you shouldn't listen to them in some areas, and you do, and you should listen to them in other areas, and you don't because God knows that we're just dumb. You know, we, we need a lot of help. We need His Holy Spirit to help us. So John's letting us know, man, we, we've got some serious problems. And so he says he knows what's in man. And listen to this. As soon as he says this, now there was a man. <laughs> so what's he saying? Who is he? He's named Nicodemus. He's a man of the Pharisees. You know, those the, the, the Pharisees, it's like, it, I see fair. I see myself fair. I'm a Pharisee, right? <laughs> Named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man, Jesus did not believe in them because he knew all people. He didn't need anybody to bear witness about it. He knew what was in Nicodemus. I mean, it, look, it looks great. He comes to him. Maybe there's a little problem because he comes at night. So in the going back to Genesis chapter three, what did what did he do? Is it's like he he lost uh, he lost the presence of God, and what did he do? He hid from God, and a lot of times we find ourselves hiding from God, thinking that we can hide from God. And then what else did he do? It says they made for themselves clothing of fig leaves. They sewed together and made a covering for themselves. But God wasn't satisfied with that. In Genesis chapter 3, the first reading, Genesis chapter 3, it says that he made coats of skin. So he had to, just like we have to, just like that his son would be the Lamb of God that would literally have to be ripped and torn apart and literally destroyed on the cross. His wrath poured out on that son. He had to kill innocent animals in order to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve, sowing fig leaves. Anything that we try to do to save ourselves is like sowing fig leaves. It's, it's not going to cover our nakedness. There's going to be an apparel, uh, what do they call it when it messes up? <laughs> yeah, malfunction, yeah. You know, these intentional malfunctions of all these uh, sexy ladies that intentionally malfunction to attract a whole bunch of men. I mean, gosh, give it, help us, Lord. <laughs> that should be the National Fools League, NFL, man, fools. <laughs> God knows us. He knows what's going on. And, man, we, we, we look and care about things that we don't need to be caring about. We need to know what God thinks. And Jesus knew this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. So he calls him the title Rabbi. And he says, you're a teacher from God. Nobody can do these things that you're doing unless God is with him. 
and you'd think, boy, you know, Jesus would feel, oh, this is really great. This guy's a teacher. He's a great one. He's come talking to me. And this is what he says, truly, truly. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's like Jesus Christ, I'm the king, I'm God with you. And right now you're just saying that I've been, I've, I've been sent from God. You, you don't even have a clue of who I am. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you. Unless, notice he's saying, I'm not saying this to somebody else. I'm saying this to you. Do you notice how direct Jesus is? A lot of times we'll hear Jesus, we'll hear something and he says it and, and, it, and it's the Holy Spirit that's saying it and, and you'll say, well, I'm so glad that he's finally talking to this guy in the home. He needs to hear this. You know. No, no, he's saying it to you, right? He, he said it, truly, truly. No, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you. And then he answered him again, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you can't see it unless you're born again. You can't uh, enter it unless you're born of water and of the Spirit. And that's a picture probably out of Ezekiel. And it's probably looking at that passage that's similar to Dead Bones Living, 36, 37. And it's the picture of the Spirit of God and water. And it's talking about the cleansing that comes through the Word of God in our life, and then the Spirit, the spiritual work of renewal and making us new, regenerating us, unless that happens, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, notice he said it again, I said to you. I don't know how many times I've heard a message. <laughs> I remember one time, hearing Dr. Tom Nettle say, he says, uh, I'd never heard a message that I couldn't get over yet. I couldn't get over until he heard David Miller preach. And he said, I can't say that anymore. And I'm thinking, never heard a sermon that you couldn't get over. And I think, yeah, that's kind of what we do, don't we? We hear a sermon and we get over it. And instead of taking it to heart, I'm being changed by it, we get over it. There's a difference in getting over a sermon and getting into a sermon and allowing God to do something in your life. When you meet Jesus Christ, it's real. When you meet Jesus Christ, it's life. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So he's talking to the, it's literally in the Greek, the teacher. It's not a teacher uh, or, you know, it's not like he calls him a teacher. And uh, the, the thing is that you're the teacher. You're the teacher and yet you don't know this. And, and that's what he says there in verse 10. Jesus answered him, are you the teacher? And Nicodemus calls him a teacher I'm, he does he maybe he's not thinking this, but Jesus says, you're the teacher. Maybe he's reading his thoughts of what he's thinking. I'm the teacher, but I do, I am interested in how this guy's doing these signs. You know, how, how's he doing this? And he says, you don't understand these things. So how are you under, how are you going to understand the spiritual things that, that I'm, if you can't even understand earthly things. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Isn't that amazing that you can hear the wind? You know, 
<laughs> you can hear it. Man. And when all of a sudden these old dead bones start living, they rattling back and he puts life in us and takes us dead, stinking sinners and gives life in us. And it's amazing how we're changed and how we're different when it's real, when it's of the Holy Spirit. There's power in that. So I, I'm just amazed at, at uh, this incredible teaching. And in verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, how many times does he have to? Nicodemus, you're not listening to me. You're not hearing. He, he says it again and again and again. I say to you, how many times are we going to have to hear it? How many times do we have to hear it before we believe it, before we receive it, before we see it, before we enter in? Don't think that we're better than Nicodemus. Don't think that, uh, man, we're probably worse than Nicodemus. But thank God when Jesus enters in, life comes in and deadness becomes alive and death and stink and all of that becomes alive and there's renewal and the renewal of the Holy Spirit and this incredible thing that happens in our life. He says, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And in the book of John, several times Jesus asked that question, how can you believe? He says, you, you can't believe. If you're seeking glory from man, you, you cannot believe. It's a moral impossibility for you to believe if you're trying to be praised by men. Your praise has to come from God and God alone. If you're seeking praise of men, if you're seeking to please Pastor Moore or Pastor Norm or Pastor Louie or Pastor or whatever or somebody, if you're trying to please your parents or, your, you know, if, 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 if that's what's going on, that's not going to cut it. It's like God, it's His glory. That's who we have to please. No one has ascended into heaven except He who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal what? Life. Hey, that's what Jesus can do for us. He can give us life. We're, we're, we're dead. We stink worse than a skunk. All the stuff that we've done. Yeah, I'm talking to you and you and you and you. Yeah, I'm talking to all of us. So they were bit by a serpent. They were dying from the snake bite. And God told them to take a serpent, put it on a pole, and lift it up. Kind of like Jesus would become sin for us and be lifted up on a pole and crucified. And he says, when people look upon the serpent, they'll be healed. And they could say, boy, that just doesn't make any sense. Have you ever said that? Man, I hear that preacher talking about receiving Jesus Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. That doesn't make any sense at all. Surely there's something I've got to do. <laughs> no, it's what Jesus has done for you. And if you don't receive that, if you don't look, to Jesus, if you don't trust Him, if you don't look away from yourself and look to the remedy, Jesus Christ, if you don't look upon Jesus and believe, and that's what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, He says, you've got to believe in Me. You've got to not just look at the signs and believe in the signs. The signs speak of Me and who I am, but you've got to believe Me. And when you do, you get life. And I love it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Isn't that great? I'm telling you, life. And that's what happens. And that's what happened to that Samaritan woman. All of a sudden, she had life. 
So John chapter 3, you have a religious guy who thinks he's right with God. And, uh, you know, he, he becomes a secret believer. But, you know, in the book of Acts, we don't really hear too much about Nicodemus. To me, that's a tragedy. Nicodemus could have been the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. But we don't read that. Did he miss his moments? Did he, where, you know, it's like he was a secret believer. What does that mean? Life. Let me just show you another passage of scripture. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. You see what I'm saying? When we when Jesus is lifted up and we look to him, we look to him and we live. We live. There's life when we look to Jesus. Eternal life. Look at Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Does that sound like something that you've got to do? That sounds like something that Jesus has done for you. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When Jesus comes in, he gives us life. Real life. Spiritual life, eternal life. And that means something. That means we were dead. The wages of sin is death. But the gift, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look to me. Look to that as you look. The Son of Man must be lifted up like the serpent and if we look to Him and believe on Him, we have eternal life. That's what makes the difference. Believing in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, this is the Word of God. This isn't Pastor Richard's thoughts. This is God's Word. And I'm trying to explain it to you. But only the Spirit of God can open your mind and your heart till you can understand it. And I'm praying that he's doing that. I mean, he, over and over again. Don't miss it. It's there. You can't miss I say to you, you, hey, not somebody else, not you teaching, you great teacher, you, if you don't believe in me, you don't have eternal life. That's powerful. <laughs> Amen. I mean, years ago, we would say stuff like this. He says, my, my only drug problem was I was drugged to church. I attended every service, every time the door was open. I, and, and I said, you know, I became a really good Pharisee. Just recently, I was convicted of something that I had wrote somebody. This person was writing to me, basically asking for forgiveness. And I answered just like a very great Pharisee. And I hadn't thought about it. And, and, I, and I think, you know, I probably never asked that person to forgive me for being such a Pharisee. But I've gotten up and said, hey, I'm a, I'm a you guys are recovering addicts. I'm a recovering Pharisee. <laughs> it's amazing how we can point our fingers and criticize and condemn and judge people. And I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I said, I, I can't believe that. And it's like here, this is 50 years later or more, 60 years later. And, and it's like, because I think he's trying to teach me something. And that is that Phariseeism is never the answer. It's Jesusism. And Jesus can get you off drugs. 
Jesus can get you off of religion. Jesus can give you life. But nothing else brings life. Look to me. Don't look to your denomination or your abomination. Look to me and live. Look to Jesus. Father, we thank you for the word of God, for its power in our life. Thank you that uh, when we receive you, that we are changed and we're different. And help us to desire you, to hunger and thirst after you. May you give us something that's real. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, come and lead us in worship once again.